Has Britain witnessed a cultural coup? Do we have uh, a new elite, a new social order? To examine this question, I'm joined by uh, Matthew Goodwin, who is Professor of Politics at the University of Kent, and who's written a new book called Values, Voice and Virtue. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Right, let's, let's dive straight in. So you describe uh, the emergence of a new elite. Um, so who are they? Who are the new elite? And what do they believe? Yeah, so firstly, I decided to, to write this book to try and explain this remarkable decade that we've just gone through in British politics. I think we've really seen three big rebellions that historians are going to point to. We've seen the rise of populism, we've seen the rise of Brexit, we've seen the rise of Boris Johnson and mm -hmm. the, the sort of realignment that came with 2019. So the book is really my um, interpretation of what caused all of that mm -hmm. and why many of the upheavals are going to stay with us. And at the heart of it is the rise of this new elite in, mm. in the country. It's not unique to Britain, but really what we've seen over the last half century is the rise of a new middle class graduate elite, typically mm. university graduates from elite institutions mm. who tend to share the same cultural outlook, the same set of values, um, whose voice disproportionately dominates mm. not just politics, but much of the prevailing culture. Mm and who are increasingly embracing a worldview, a belief system, um, which encourages them to look down on other groups in society and to treat some groups as being morally inferior to others. And, and these three mm. drivers, this sense of uh, the, uh, the elite holding a particular set of values which other mm. people don't share, mm. their voice dominating the conversation mm. and them seeing themselves as the virtuous group within society is what I argue has really been driving this this realignment that we've been living through, not just in Britain, but across Western democracy, mm. reflected in lots of upheavals elsewhere. And this mm. this group, the new elite, I think, are really at the core of these upheavals. Mm. And you, you mentioned a key thing is basically the expansion of the university sector, the number of people that go to university, which uh, informs and affects their values and uh, the decline in manufacturing and the decline of the number of people that describe themselves as working class. And that comes out in voting, doesn't it, eventually? Yeah, so essentially what we've seen is um, it's not just the rise of a university class, but really the rise of a, of a group within that class. Mm. Um, uh, typically graduates from Oxbridge, Russell Group institutions um, have been referred to as identity liberals who mm. feel less attached than others to the nation state. Mm. They feel less proud of the national community. They, le they feel um, less uh, determined to protect uh, Britain's distinctive identity mm. and heritage. Mm. Um, they're much more preoccupied with uh, prioritising minority interests over mm. the majority. Mm. Um, they are at times quite openly politically intolerant mm. of people who hold uh, different beliefs uh, and viewpoints. And over the last half century or so, um, this group has essentially consolidated their position of dominance mm. in our society in a number of ways. Mm. Um, they have dominated the education system. They benefited from this university meritocracy. The mm. children of the new graduate elite have been the most likely to follow them into the elite institutions. They've dominated geographically because they live in the main epicenters of economic growth, of um, prosperity, of dynamism. And they've also dominated politically. They've essentially taken over left and right in politics, mm -hmm. but they've also taken over many other institutions. So we've seen this consolidation take place over the last half century or so, which as I'm sure we'll come to talk about, has left millions of people essentially feeling as though the elite that dominates Britain today uh, really isn't all that interested in them. But also crucially, and I, I know we'll come talk about this, it's very different from the old elite. Britain's mm. always been dominated by an elite, but actually mm. this new elite is much more countercultural. It is cynical, uh, sceptical, um, oppositional mm. towards many of the things that actually hold our national community together. Yeah, and one of the one of the important things in the book that you draw to is is um, the sense that previous elites actually had a sense of duty and obligation and patriotism, which the new elite d clearly doesn't have. The new elite uh, prides itself on openness, and uh, it, as you say, it's metropolitan, cosmopolitan, this way of, of looking at things. Um, 
But curiously, actually, that it's also quite insular, isn't it? I mean, it, a lot of people pride themselves on being an open, liberal attitude, but actually, uh, they only talk to themselves, don't they? I mean, it, it, one of the best things uh, to demonstrate this ever, I think, was uh, was after the um, after the 2016 Brexit vote. I think it was Tim Half of the Economist, like many others, said, "I don't know a single person that voted Brexit." Of course, he's talking about the mainstream majority of the country. So it is quite insular, isn't it? It's very insular. I think the data also backs that up. Many members of the new elite in Britain tend to live within um, segregated areas surrounded by other elites. They are uh, much more likely to marry other elite graduates. They're much mm. more likely to spend time online in the company of other mm. members of the new uh, graduate elite. They're much more likely to work in places that reinforce their mm. cultural values. And so they aren't really exposed to the cross-cutting mm. networks that you might expect, especially mm. given that many of those uh, uh, elites talk simultaneously so much about openness and diversity. And this has become apparent to me, of course, it's working absurd. in of course. in universities yeah. and being one of the very few, I guess, prominent academics who accepted the vote for Brexit and went through uh, you know, the, the aftermath of the Brexit referendum when it sort of struck me that, that more than a few of my colleagues clearly had never met a Brexit voter in, in their lives. But uh, Well, you say, actually, I'll draw, draw this out now. So I think you say in the book that half of UK academics would feel uncomfortable sitting next to a Brexit over lunch. I mean, that, yeah. that is actually laughable, but it shows so much the contempt. It's not just the insularity. Yeah. It's the utter contempt for uh, viewpoint diversity and, uh, and other people. And, and people, because I, I think what happens in voting and culturally is it takes a little bit of time for this to filter through. And I think it, we'll talk about it later probably, but, but Labour's problem was that it took a little bit of time for people, for core voters to suss out uh, how much contempt they really had for people. Yeah, I mean, I've also lived lived through that experience. I mean, I've 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 been to those lunches. I mean, mm. I felt the uh, the chilling effects yeah. on a personal yeah. uh, level, and I now find it rather humorous. And yes. I just think it's all completely ridiculous. Yeah. And many members of the new graduate elite don't really understand how ridiculous they look. It should but, be embarrassing. But but yeah. but nonetheless, a serious point here is they've also accumulated immense social, economic and cultural power. Mm. And if we want to explain just why Britain has gone through this remarkable decade of volatility and why I think it is going to remain with us for a mm. long period of time, mm. it's because members of this new graduate elite have also really shown very little um, desire to understand accommodate. or yeah. compromise yeah. or accommodate themselves with the rest mm. of the country. And we're living mm. through another example of this at the moment with the reaction to Lee Anderson, the mm. shock horror, mm. a working class former coal miner MP holds mm. values that are adrift from the new elite's values that have dominated politics for much of the last half century, uh, losing sight of the fact that actually about half of the country would endorse what mm. Lee Anderson MP uh, has been saying with regards to migration, mm. with regards to radical gender identity mm. theory, and with regards to um, uh, capital punishment. Mm. Um, so what, 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 what essentially has happened is as this elite have sort of you know, replaced the old much more culturally conservative elite. Mm. And remember, mm. this is a crucial point because people mm. will say, well, we've always had an elite in Britain, and that's true. But actually, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, we also had vehicles mm. that ensured a diverse range of voices and views were present in our politics. Mm. Trade unions, mutual cooperative societies, mm. um, working men's clubs, um, young conservatives, mm. uh, a working class elite in politics, mm. which uh, really ensured that Westminster was not completely shaped around the interests of one uh, ruling class. And today, yeah. uh, what we've seen is really the collapse of that viewpoint diversity in mm. our politics and the rise of a new cultural consensus that is not shared, actually, mm. by a large number of voters. And that's that's very dangerous. Uh, and I agree, you know, it's linked to the what John Gray calls the uh, the loss of the common life or, um, you know, the collapse of civic society and participation, uh, very key uh, important factors. But I think the key change uh, culturally is the contempt that a lot of the elite have for our own country and many of its people. That's, and that is something quite new and that's why you're right to call it a revolution. Yeah, well, John also talks about something else. John talks about the rise of hyper-liberalism. Mm. So this mm. is very distinctive from classical liberalism, yeah. what others might call radical progressivism mm. or mm. in the, the sort of public debate we often refer to as woke. Um, What's happened, I think, is, and the data I, supports this, 
is a not insignificant section of the new graduate elite, about 15% of the country, mm. if you look mm. at the data, mm. have embraced this hyper-liberalism, this radical progressivism. Mm. And that has become absolutely essential to understanding this cultural revolution that we're living through, mm. because it is not liberal um, in really three respects. And mm. I, I talk a lot of, more about this in the book, but it's important because so many people on Twitter and social media are very dismissive of this idea that we should take wokeism seriously, but I'm absolutely adamant that it is oh, it's very critical. Yes, There are three yes. reasons why this poses a major challenge for our society. One is because it routinely prioritizes fixed group identities over individual rights. Mm. Uh, it has absolutely no interest in individual rights. It is, it is about dividing society into fixed group identities, which are organized around an oppressor victim lens. So it ben is Cobley has been talking about. Yeah. Fundamentally about power conflicts. Mm. Um, secondly, um, it is uh, very dismissive, if not openly cynical towards the objective um, scientific method. Mm. Um, it routinely prioritizes lived experience over the objective scientific method, which in the universities I found as to be one of the most remarkable aspects of radical progressivism. It is, it is advocated by many of the people who simultaneously are supposed to be the most educated yeah. within our society. In fact, as we're talking today, I read in the newspaper on the tube that an, 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 a science association in, in America has now said it wants to do away with the binary distinction That's between right. male and female. So I, another example of that. I saw the same piece of, and they have a list of words that are bad words, right. man, woman, yeah. <laughs> basics. Yeah, I mean, we've, yeah. we've gone through the looking glass. Yeah. Uh, and, and thirdly, um, radical progressivism has absolutely no interest in, and if anything, repudiates the, the things that hold us together as a national community. That's right. Shared history, shared yeah. identity, shared values. Mm. So um, as the new elite have, have sort of embraced this, this philosophy, mm. a section of the new elite, um, what, what I argue has happened, particularly from the 80s onwards, actually, is that we've been pushed into this political and cultural revolution by a sort of loose alliance essentially mm. of of a much more socially liberal graduate class within it a sort of radically progressive minority but very activist minority mm. Mm. and they presided over this big social uh, and political project mm. which has completely transformed britain and this yeah. is not unique to us it's That's happened throughout, in throughout many the other yeah. western democracies but it's important that we mm. define what we mean by revolution mm. and and what i think has happened is is we have been subjected to a revolution that essentially has been defined by um by by a, a number of specific things one mm. is a commitment to hyper globalization mm. the the eradication of uh, national boundaries a national economy and preference of free trade um uh, and the liberalization of finance. Yeah. Um, we were told, Tony Blair among others, this would only lift all boats. The evidence and the consensus in economics today is very different. Night Actually, and day. it yeah. had a yeah. very um, significant disproportional costs on workers and on graduates. Secondly, the, um, uh, the depoliticization of politics. We've essentially had meaningful choice, meaningful debate stripped out of politics. And this is partly linked to what academics often call governance, the rise mm. of bodies, institutions, mm. agencies that are not democratically elected, that are not accountable to ordinary people. So-called expertise as well. Yeah. So-called expertise, the European Union, mm. the democratic deficit within the European mm. Union, the fact that actually there is no competition for executive mm. office within mm. the European Union, among other things. Um, Colin Crouch famously touched on this in his book, Post Democracy, in which he said essentially in the early 2000s, national democracy had been reduced to a spectacle. Mm. It had just become actually a, a game among competing elites over who can. Um, Who's in which chair? Over who can triangulate the electorate. But meaningful mm. choice and meaningful opposition had essentially left uh, the building. And of course, lastly, this experiment with mass immigration uh, and rapid social change, which we tend to think, or my students tend to think has always been the norm, mm. um, but actually from 2004 onwards, this is a very new experiment in the history of, of, uh, of, of, of Britain and other Western democracies, um, and has come to be another defining feature of this revolution. And so mm. by the time you really get to the 2010s, mm. Mm. You've basically got this uh, sweeping transformative project that is committed to hyper-globalization, stripping, stripping away mm. political choice, mm. uh, imposing 
uh, this technocratic elite class mm. uh, and which is also overwhelmingly committed to reshaping the country around mass migration and rapid mm. uh, social change mm. uh, and also within that the economy mm. around a, a consumption model of cheap labor That's right. uh, and this sets a, this really sets a foundation for the rise of these new conflicts these new divides in our society which found their expression through the rise of uh, Nigel Farage, UK Independence Party, mm. then the vote for Brexit, then Boris Johnson and the realignment. Mm. And we mm. talk a bit more about those divides, but to mm. me, this revolution has been at the at, at the centre of it, this mm. sort of top-down, elite-led revolution. Mm. Well, I mean, you, 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 on the divides, let's put those aside for the moment. I, I mean, they're, they're acute, they're, they're not, I don't think they're particularly bridgeable, so I think the correct response to it is to attempt to find a vehicle uh, so people can find their voice, the people that don't find their uh, interests are being looked after now. So that's a different thing. But let's take the three things you mentioned in a bit more detail. Hyperglobalization, starting with um, this, really started under Thatcher, didn't it? I mean, you, you're, some of the consequences downstream of what she did, probably she didn't anticipate. But I always think, I always think, all grieve was the sort of pivot point where we, mm. we cease to be a national economy, national coal board, national union of miners, talking about what we should do as a nation. And it just goes. And then you get, I mean, I'll be rude and crude because we don't have that long. But it, but basically, I see the Tories as sort of asset stripping spivs. They don't care about the country very much. Everything is for sale. Can't distinguish the, the country from a shop. And uh, they should pay a price for that politically, I think. Um, but that's what we've got. And then there's a, a denial amongst economic liberals that uh, there, are, there aren't winners and losers. There are clearly the knowledge economy, the people, um, you know, the, the newly credentialized uh, uh, degree holders, they, they've done okay on, on this. They've uh, done but, better than okay. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and of course, they take it for granted that the world should turn in their favor. Meanwhile, anything in this country, anything from the Midlands up, basically, is a whole series of deindustrialized. Uh, communities, cities, and particularly towns, and you only you only have to fight by elections in places like Airdrie or Backley or or Hartlepool, which we've done, to see that the whole the whole of the fabric is undermined. You you lose the industrial job, you destroy the family, and you just destroy the foundation of the whole place. And as you say in the book, actually, then people are just shuffling around doing delivery. Uh, uh, deliveries and, 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 and on precarious wages, so you've lost your yeah. foundation. But I, but what's astonishing is that the the, the pro-industrial, free trade, sceptical voice, it's almost not heard in this country. Do you agree? I mean, I, we, I think Patrick O'Flynn and I were, the, were, were were probably the only. It's a small voice, but pre No Deal and pre twenty nineteen, we were the only ones saying, "Well, don't do a deal," because actually, I'm I want more trade friction, I want more reshoring, and I think. It sounds sacrilege, but I, I think tariffs actually, we're now in a situation where as an economy, we're more like a developing economy, industrially, uh, that would need tariffs to reindustrialize. And all of this is uh, sacrilege to the people that take it for granted that, as Blair said, as night follows day, you can't resist it. Yeah, well, I mean, on the, on the 80s, first of all, I've been influenced um, by the work of Danny Roderick, the economist, also David Otto Me and too. others, I, 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 who, who, are, who are very convincing on this, that yeah. essentially, Look, there are lots. There are some positive things that come with global markets. Nobody, nobody's saying that that there isn't. And and also with Thatcher, you know, people mm. who are overwhelmingly negative about Thatcher, as I say in the book, forget mm. what a state the country was in in the 1970s. We needed some reform. The issue with mm. Thatcher is that the particular um, program that she pursued came with enormous costs. And crucially, about hyperglobalization, something that I think many economic liberals miss is those costs were not just economic, right? So on the economic lens, it's easy enough now, the evidence is overwhelming that hyperglobalization had enormous, what are called distributional costs on workers, non-graduates and industrial communities. I think that is now beyond dispute. I think the evidence on that is very clear. I think that contributed to the remarkable and very depressing inter-regional inequalities in this country, yeah. which Philip McCann and others have shown that there are parts of England that are basically as divided and unequal as Eastern Germany. Different and, countries. Uh, utterly different countries. I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah, someone that's lived in the north of England, somebody yeah. who's, whose wife is from the north of England, I'm regular, you know, I'm very aware of the extreme inequalities in, in, in England. So, so the economic case 
I think is now has now been made. And it's been interesting to watch economists pivot on this. Because if you go back to the late 90s and the early 2000s, mm. the argument which Blair and others uh, put forward was that this would only be a positive thing. As you say, there was a famous speech in which he said, you know, if you're critical of globalization, basically you're an idiot. Mm. You don't understand. Mm. Actually, it turns out Blair was wrong. There's many wrong many of the leading advocates of globalization massively overlook the extent to which it would impact on Western workers and non-graduates. And the evidence on that is overwhelming. But it isn't only, it, it isn't only economic, it is also cultural. Mm. And this is my, <clears throat> my, my issue with conservatives, mm. especially conservative liberals. Um, if you constantly make the argument that free trade is beneficial, you are simultaneously overlooking the extent to which hyper-globalization has undermined family life, mm. has undermined community life, Destroyed. has undermined shared norms. And the, mm. there is no coincidence, it is, it is not a coincidence that, that as we've experimented with this project, we've we, marriage rates have collapsed across uh, the country, especially in communities mm. that were hit hard by this project. Alcoholism, drug addiction has, has, has increased. Yeah. The deaths of despair yeah. that Angus Deaton and others have talked about have become very, very real. Social capital has declined, the, uh, the extent to which people are engaging in community life. Now, ordinarily, mm. you would expect conservatives to be talking about these things, to be concerned about these things. But because they've routinely prioritized global free trade but they're and not, globalization. But they're not conservatives, Matthew. So the, 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 that's my problem with the people that have governed us, whether it's uh, in New Labour, who are you know, basically a form of Tories, and the, the Tories themselves. You, if you scan, I do scan the parliamentary party anyway, I can find about two or three people that think like us and want to, as you say, I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Danny Roderick as well. He describes it as a, a call for a softer liberalism, uh, a globalism, softer uh, globalism. And, and, and actually he's being very Keynesian. If you read Keynes, you know, he, he understood the importance of let's make things where people are, if you can, basically it's a good idea. It's not just the, the, the total dominance of free trade purism ideology. People took everything for granted in the discourse. The discourse post-Brexit was, how are you going to get a trade deal? You're going to say, well, we've got a trade surplus with these states. Leave it. Please, leave it. For goodness sake, you won't have any agriculture left if you do a trade deal with them. Uh, and that was so countercultural. But my, my criticism, I mean, the, I, we called our economics green paper the end of indifference because they, all of these econ liberals are indifferent to what is made where and by whom, but they're also uh, indifferent to who owns what. And if you, if you don't care about who owns what, I mean, the indifference to what is made is, is you end up with a massive trade deficit, which you've got to pay for. You've got a massive trade problem, you just get poorer. You owe, you owe more and own less at the end of each year. And to be indifferent, I mean, no politician, Macmillan or Gateskill or Shaw or anyone previously uh, would have been that foolish. But they've been inc incredibly foolish. And, uh, and just on that point, I was, I've also been quite influenced by David Edgerton's uh, great. book, The Rise and Fall of great. the British Nation, yeah. which is a really interesting book. And obviously, I imagine David and I would have some differences on the cultural questions, but on the economic questions, I think he's spot on, that essentially what we saw was a stripping away of national assets. Yeah. Uh, and uh, by the time you get to the 90s or 2000s, Britain's not really making anything anymore. And what we've, what we've done is we've replaced those jobs with really hollow, empty, meaningless positions whereby you know adult men are having to cobble together three or four jobs just to get by have almost no dignity really in their lives uh, are having to compete increasingly with others in society and uh, as a consequence we, we we end up seeing much of the political turbulence that we've seen but they didn't realize how strategically lethal it could be and we haven't I don't think we've actually got to the sort of end point of this um, so during the pandemic, you realise as you're scrabbling around for supplies, you don't have any, you don't have much industry left, and you're you're desperate. Um, but it doesn't occur to them that actually, if you base your whole economy, I mean the whole British economy is based on one world class financial services industry in London and one big city, which is like a sort of, uh, it's almost like a sort of ghost ghost city, uh, 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 you know, capital of a ghost empire. Now it's a strange yeah. place, yeah. London in many ways. But it's 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 that right. And if you lose that. All the economists that advise us say, you lose that. And it's not guaranteed that you will keep it. You lost every, every other industry. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, you're sort of into, uh, you know, if we're, if we're doing well, the salaries that you might get in Poland or 
even worse, actually. You could, I mean, and they're, and they're coming up and we're going down. But it's an incredibly dangerous policy to have. But if, if you look at the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, I think that's been revealing in that the priority for, for a majority of Conservatives has been how to deregulate financial services. Yes. It's essentially been the Edinburgh reforms, how mm. to make life mm. easier for the city, maybe with the exception of some of the talk around levelling up and investment zones, which has not been anywhere near as developed as it should have been, uh, and has still also been principally about deregulation, there's been really no major interest mm. in those areas outside of, of London and elsewhere. And that, in my mind, is a continuation of this revolution which we're still living through. Brexit was a rebuke to that. Brexit, for many people, as we talked about, a lot about over recent years. Mm. Brexit was not a desire to build a Davos on Thames. It no, was no. not a Trussite no. vision. It no. was principally for most of the leavers and I, a majority of leavers, it, it was for a very different kind of Britain. Mm. It was a Britain that was in many respects more interventionist economically, but culturally much more conservative than the new elite is willing to be. Oh, they don't, they still don't get it. They still, the astonishing thing is when it happened, and I, I acknowledge we have to say, oh, you know, Brexit is of the left variety, Brexit variety. We, we have to acknowledge and hold our, our hands up. The, actually, the Brexit coalition was never, I mean, I, you know, Johnson uh, was successful politically temporarily in resolving it after Miller II and, and the blockages. But, uh, you know, the, the, if we're honest about it, uh, Johnson could never reconcile the Brexit coalition, which was convened in 2016. Why? Because it was impossible to rec reconcile. It was impossible to do so. Uh, we wanted very, very different things. Most prominent advocates for Brexit wanted what they, you know, sort of clueless, unilateral free trade. Um, you know, I also sort of joke you could only be in the payment of the Communist Party of China if you really believe that. Uh, you know, and, and, and they wanted that and they, 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 they took it for granted. I mean, all these silly models you mentioned, you call it Davos on Thames. People used to call it uh, Singapore on Thames. And I used to say, well, actually, I know a bit about Singapore. You know, I've got family links there for 40 years, 50 years. Uh, I'll have some of that. Good public transport, good public housing, social order. I'll take some of that. Oh, and industrial policy as well. So that even what they were describing, they didn't really understand. So I think it was a completely harebrained uh, vision and it could never... The only, the well, only post-Brexit vision that made any sense was a left-wing one. Well, the... the the incompatibility of Johnsonism, and I, I'm dubious of that term because I don't think Johnson had much of a program, no. <clears throat> um, became instantly visible with the immigration reforms. And yes. that's where it became very clear that actually, you know, if you're sympathetic to Johnson, as I talk about in the book, you could say, well, you know, his premiership was completely knocked off course by COVID and then war in Ukraine. But actually, if you look through that and at the detail of what he brought forward, you know, the immigration reforms were basically the opposite to what most of his voters wanted a it's massive insane. liberalization and it also most people haven't even looked at the detail right one of the remarkable things to me was that johnson actually stripped away mm. the 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 requirement for british employers to advertise jobs in britain mm. first right that went and they lowered the, uh, lowered the, the wage salary threshold yeah. was yeah. dropped to 25 yeah. grand 23 grand in some cases uh, even lower in some sectors and and we were sort of sold this narrative that actually what was happening was Britain was pivoting to a high skill migration policy, which was absolutely nonsense. Lies. What basically happened was yeah. Johnson liberalised the entire regime, including international student migration mm. and dependence. We then saw net migration after COVID. Mm. Now today surged mm. to 500,000, 1.1 million visas mm. last year. And so what many voters have seen, and I don't quite think they've twigged yet the extent to which uh, these changes have been pulled through, but what voters have seen, particularly leavers, cultural conservatives, what I call traditionalists, people who want to slow the pace mm. of change in the country, people who want strong and defined national borders, mm. people who are accepting of some immigration, mm. but they would rather have net migration. And I talk about this in the book, the experiment, which finds that ideally people want net migration of around 100,000, not 500,000. Or 50. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, that, that, that this is really what they've currently been given is not really what, what, well, they, what, what I, they want. I want to get to it at the end of the uh, discussion because uh, about the sort of consequences for the political consequences for the parties involved because I think they I mean I think the Tories are going to get absolutely hammered. I, I, I enjoy quoting their uh, 2019 manifesto because it's, it's I mean forget what's happening on the south coast which is slightly happened prior, you know, it's happened post that, uh, it is ramped up after that election. But if you read the manifesto, you know, we will have a, a border which puts us in, in control. We will control borders, we will reduce migration. 
And to, 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 to have that as your offer to the public, and people voted on it in good faith, and to do something completely different, which I argue they do in every election. I mean, they do this on family. They, the Tory party don't talk about family, uh, tra the traditional family or family life at all until the election. They might say a few things, and they carry on with the same sort of, uh, you know, runaway liberalism in office. And it's in the end, it's, it takes time, but they'll be hammered for it. They'll be absolutely hammered for it. I want to just move on to because that's you know the tr the trade and, and but, I, but, but just before you do move mm. on because I think this is a really important point. If you look globally um, and you and, and you look or at least in Western democracies and you look at centre right parties, mm. there is a philosophical civil war that is beginning to brew within conservatism, mm. which is about what what is this ideology in the 2020s or the early 21st century? And so far, the most interesting responses to that question have come not from Britain. But have come from elsewhere. They've mm. come from America. They've come from Italy. They've come from other democracies where actually you're seeing centre-right conservatives being much more willing to intervene uh, with regard to yes. big tech, yes. with regard to <clears throat> radical progressivism, mm. with regard to institutions, universities and elsewhere that have been much more um, aware at how important, critically important, the cultural axis in politics is mm. um, and conservatives in Britain have been to be blunt hopeless on all of those issues the basically the, the, they've they've absorbed but the, the rhetoric of their opponents they've allowed issues like women's rights migration and totally. borders yeah. to be defined as culture wars yes now yeah. now yeah. you know in my book children's welfare women's rights Basics. national identity yeah borders yeah, yeah. are not culture wars right yeah, they are yeah. foundations of civilization they're things that most voters care about yes. most voters want to talk yes. about most voters want to uphold but conservatives have been so quick to cede territory mm. that they've now sort of found themselves in a cul-de-sac yeah, they've they, got nowhere to go they do yeah I and mean, there's a couple of things on that so they, they what i describe it as a situation where uh, to react to the insanity the madness is to be accused of stoking a culture war. And the cause of that is by just not asserting the basics and holding the line, mm. simple as that. And on the, on the conservatives, uh, just before we move on, the, on the conservatives themselves, you make a very interesting observation in the book that conservative, the parliamentary party, uh, maps quite closely to Labour voters, actually, who are, yeah. who are in a different place to the Labour Party, which is absolutely fascinating. But they don't, I mean, such as they, I don't, I wouldn't put my money on the Tory party in Britain going through this intellectual exercise of where we go. Uh, I think I think the patriotic left, uh, you know, conservative left, is much better in the states and in Europe than they are at this stuff. And I think as an offer, a political offer, uh, when I when I get in front of conservatives and increasingly, oh, I have done for a long time, um, particularly the public and voters, they'll take a little bit of our social market stuff. They'll take. They're not actually. You know, nationalising utilities or you know not wanting utilities uh, Thames Water owned by foreign entities and siphoning off money abroad and destroying your balance of payments every year. They don't like that very much. And actually, you say, well, actually, shouldn't it be a public asset? It's a it's a public monopoly. Yes, it will take that. Same with railways mm. and housing as well. If you want, you know, state intervention in the housing market, I think is nimbyism aside, is is, is actually quite popular. So they'll have our they'll have our left-wing part of the agenda. We're, we're as pro-market or more pro-market uh, in terms of the, the basic needs of society, you know, mm. most products. Of course, you want markets to work and that's the only, mm. that's the best way to do it. Um, so I, I always say we're not asking for very much and wanting to defend the social market boundary mm. frontier and they'll go with it. So I think I'm very excited about that. Let me move on because I, I want to talk about the, um, you, you talk about powerlessness, people not, be, not having their voice heard, mm. power, powerlessness, and uh, you know you get events like recent events in Nosley. Mm. Uh, th that's a consequence. People like Peter Shaw warned us about this. If you don't, if there's not a way of people feeling they influence politics, they stop voting. You, you know, if you balkanize your society, you're on the way to things like that. It's terrifying. But you talk about the transfer of power to uh, elites or experts or technocrats or supranational institutions and I think this is key because it, it might bore some people but you run through the list of what can and can't happen who decides right WTO the EU or uh, you know uh, judicial adjudication of things that should be a matter of legislation so you let you know you have a public a voting public they you know vote for people and we have a parliament 
and the executive, and you vote for things, and you decide things like you know gay rights in the sixties. We decide it through Parliament. Now it's increasingly decided by or adjudicated by uh, the courts, or or we have a, a a national board or board of sovereignty which is fettered entirely because of the conventions we're in. Can you do you agree with me that that's a major problem and and you, you can't ignore it. You've got to deal with this. You've got to reconnect, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. No, I completely agree. And it was especially apparent while we were in the European Union. I mean, mm. I, I was, uh, I've always been influenced by the, the, the academic literature on the EU's democratic deficit. Yeah. You know, and the fact that actually, if you look at what makes institutions genuinely democratic, mm. you know, they have to provide regular elections. Mm. They have to allow voters to elect representatives, and they have to allow voters. Uh, to have meaningful mm. influence over mm. over high executive office, mm. um, the EU only does two of those things, right? The EU gives people mm. a say through elections, allows them to elect members mm. of the European Parliament, but it does not give them uh, meaningful influence over over high executive office. So, the pa- yeah, but the part I mean, the European Parliament mm. is a is a is a joke. I mean, the, the real power is in the Council. I mean, you can you can argue it's democratic because you know member states uh, appoint. The council, you yep. can argue that, but it's terrible. Well, you're yeah. preaching to the choir. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was always won over most strongly in any any of the arguments over Brexit. I didn't campaign for Brexit. I accepted the vote afterwards. But mm. the most powerful argument to me was the argument about a reassertion of national democracy. Mm. Many of the arguments that Peter mm. Shaw, mm. Tony Benn, and others made mm. in earlier decades. I was never particularly fussed about any of the other stuff. But to me, it was about having um, uh, the right uh, and the ability to make decisions mm. about one's nation state in one's nation state and mm. not for governments to be locked in mm. to policies that are decided at the European or an international mm. level mm. Uh, and whereby those governments and their successors are locked into policies that citizens cannot influence. And we saw this most dramatically, of course, with freedom of movement. I mean, this yeah. was the quintessential example of, a, of an EU policy that basically voters had zero influence over. And were it not for that issue, we would not have had the vote for Brexit. We wouldn't have had the rise of populism. Mm. And you would have thought in the aftermath of the referendum that, that leaders in on both the left and right would have understood the the message of that. But actually, actually they, they really haven't. And so the EU, to me, became a symbol of the rise of governance, of mm. the rise of institutions and agencies that are so remote from people's lives. Mm that they cannot actually exert meaningful influence over the decisions that are affecting they their can't. lives. Yeah, they, 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 it, it's the structured, it's structured uh, to deny, I mean, I, I, again, make the case for sort of centre-left economics or whatever, you know, hold, you know, keeping a steel plant open or building your own trains, whatever case you want to, mm. to use. Um, that These things are put beyond reach of the governance, uh, of, of the government, national governments, and Therefore, beyond reach of voters, and and it's it's a lethal situation. I think we're a fully integrated. The case I always use is a fully integrated EU member state within inside the euro. A Portuguese or, or someone will go to a, a voting booth and and have no purchase on about five or six major things, you know, monetary policy or immigration policy or trade policy. Nothing. You you can't elect a person that has anything to say on those things, which I think is a lethal, potentially lethal. Uh, uh, situation and it doesn't and I think the what you call the new elite or the high prog- progressives or whatever I think they they're very short-sighted because what they don't see is the potential danger of concentrating that much power unaccountable power in one place and they don't object to it why because they're winning at the moment the, the right people the people on the right step are on the good step are in charge but what happens well, when, think, yeah. Yeah, what happens when that changes in Europe? Well, I was going to say they're not short-sighted, they're self-interested. I mean, if you look at, say, the work of Chris Bickerton and, uh, and, and other scholars who have, who have shown, I think quite conclusively, that mm. elites today derive their legitimacy and authority not from their vertical relationship with voters below, no, no. but from their horizontal relationships with other elites and with other people other. like yeah. them in other global yeah. cities and other countries around the world. I see this in academia all the time. Mm. I mean, it's 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 essentially a, a, a very different uh, power power game that's that's mm. playing out. Um, <laughs> but that helps to explain why voters 
by the time you really got to 2019, and even today, mm. large majorities of voters, especially working class voters, mm. especially voters in the non-graduate majority, yes, yes. and especially voters outside of the big cities and the university towns, will say people like me have no say in government because, mm. to be blunt, they don't. No, they don't. Um, but and, if, and, 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 and I just want to just, just mm. elaborate on one mm. point here, which is, the loss of control, the sense of powerlessness, is not only about political power. Mm. It is also about cultural power. Mm. That in pretty much every institution we can look at today, creative industries, mm. cultural institutions, museums, mm. galleries, publishing, universities, schools, mm. uh, you, it's, you know, uh, marketing, advertisements, BBC, large chunks of the media, yeah. um, the sense of powerlessness is entirely valid because yeah. those groups within society not only yeah. lack voice, mm. but their voice is simultaneously stigmatized as being morally inferior, right? They are yeah, presented as chavs, far-right idiots, maniacs, morally suspicious, dangerous, um, you know, gammons, Karens, etc. Yeah. Et this is this is what you, you, you refer in, in the book as sort of the politics of humiliation. And I yeah. agree with you. And, and, and it's astonishing how, uh, how poor some of the people that want to govern us and have governed us are. They just don't pick this up. I mean, the famous Hillary Clinton thing, or or, or Bram with uh, you know, uh, you know, the incident of 2010. They a lot of them just don't get this. They don't really get it. But as you say, I mean, I didn't. We, we could talk about this, the the the, the, the virtue thing, because uh, virtue, um, the virtue of the new elite has become the new currency. That's the new hierarchy. It's not so much. It is. It's all be money. To some extent, but what people, what what the uh, the educated want really is um, is 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 to be seen as virtuous and righteous. Well, so just on that point, because I think this is critical. Again, um, um, it was Daniel Bell actually in the seventies who first pointed to how the elite in Western democracies were increasingly deriving their status by mm. being countercultural. Mm. Um, but I think today, what's happened and various people have pointed to this, Rob Henderson at Cambridge, among others, yes, is, is the, the, the elite have essentially swapped material goods, wealth, income, uh, as, a, as a means of, of obtaining status mm. for beliefs. Mm. And, and, and in today's currency, expressing radical progressivism, Mm. expressing allegiance to identity politics, deriving a sense of moral righteousness, of victimhood, is today's way of the elite garnering That's status. The, and, and that basically runs through pretty mm. much everything. It runs yeah. through the BBC homepage, it runs through Radio 4 Today, mm. it runs through all of the key centres of the national conversation, mm. which is um, displaying the way in which the elite have embraced this new this new way of deriving status and some of them to be frank i just you know because some of them are doing this because they have good mm. intentions mm. and they want to make the world a better place so mm. i'm not sort of out here saying you know these are all terrible people i agree with you but 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 there is also i think a big dose of narcissism that runs through today's uh new elite that essentially yeah, they are yeah. continuously to go back to chris lash and others yeah, that they yeah. are demonstrating their status uh their self-proclaimed superiority their yeah. moral superiority over others uh through this belief system and and that's quite clear to me i agree uh, no we, we're gonna have to find somebody to agree on because i agree with you. i think the, <laughs> the uh, no it is i mean well, that's chris why lash. i prioritize this conversation yes. above others when yeah. i wanted to talk about the book because i yeah. i think we have a similar diagnosis to yeah no I, th I think and chris lash you know he, he talks about you know co corporate executives being uh you know tourists in their own country the, the oikophobia is an interesting the preference for not your own group the preference for other people's culture most people, as you say, I mean, the opportunity, which I want to finally get onto, uh, most people, the majority, a bare majority anyway, sort of sniff the air and think, this is not very sensible. Come on, it's not very sensible to constantly denigrate your own society, its history, its culture, and to prefer others. It just seems mad, you know, and they get it. Um, I just want to just well, find... Well, just before you do, because yeah. I know I'm being annoying, but oikophobia, because I think, you know, one of, the, one of my regrets in my professional life is... Um, is is not not being able to have a conversation with with uh, Roger Scruton. Mm. Who we were emailing mm. shortly before he mm. he sadly passed away, and we were arranging a conversation about mm. many of these issues. But I think if you go back and you look at his work on oikophobia and so on, 
and the way in which that's clearly inspired some of the other conversations we've had recently about things like asymmetrical multiculturalism, yeah. this idea that actually... Eric's point. Yeah, Eric Kaufman's point that the new elite today are much more interested in celebrating cultures other than their own at the same time often denigrating their mm. own culture and mm. that this is also partly a way of deriving status mm. not only that but it's about prioritizing minority interests over the majority and you can see this and this is a point i just want to draw because i feel quite strongly about it you can see this in how we think of britishness mm. and how we think of how, how we can see the divide between the new governing class and everybody else. Because mm. as far as the new governing class are concerned, Britishness is increasingly to be defined mm. by universal internationalist liberal themes mm. to do with multiculturalism and diversity. Mm. We see this in the aftermath of the World Cup. We mm. see it in the aftermath of any major tournament that as far as the new elite is concerned, Britishness is chiefly about the celebration of diversity. Mm. Mm. Now, as Francis Fukuyama once said, to celebrate diversity is fine but to say that that is the bedrock of your own national identity is like saying you don't have an identity that's right. as your own well, and so what we've really drifted into is increasingly i think the embrace of this very thin very civic sense of britishness which the vast majority of people out there mm. don't actually hold that they, they want to no. they want to focus as much on what makes us distinctive, on our distinctive traditions, on our culture, mm. on our history. And this mm. is not blood and soil ethnic nationalism. No, no, just... This is simply about upholding and preserving the things that make our national community distinctive mm. and not wanting to denigrate those things over and over again every morning. When it can be, it can things. be, it can be, I agree with you, it could be George Stevens, it can be many things, but you, but uh, it's, it's the lack of will or what you want of an elite is to protect your culture to some extent. And when the cult, when the elite uh, prefers other cultures deliberately, and when it doesn't even attempt to set any cultural tone, you're in trouble. And I think the majority understand that. Just to tick off, when I, what I was getting at five minutes yes, earlier, sorry. no worries, uh, five minutes earlier about the danger of supranational institutions, the structure of the EU. Basically, I was talking about. I don't, I don't disagree. I, obviously, I think they they're very self-serving, and I think they. Uh, you know they like it when they're winning. So they, if if it is self-serving, our type of people with our type of policies and positions. But my point is, it's extraordinarily dangerous if you have a structure uh, where you could easily have. You can witness it. You know, Le Pen gets in, some other people get in, and you just get this. Probably over a, a period of three or four years, the European Union just changes markedly. And then all these uh, liberals, hyper liberals, say, "Oh, we actually, well, oh, what's going to, what are we going to do?" Oh, well, you're in real trouble then. And, and what I was getting at there is, they actually are very short-sighted. They don't realise that the structure makes it very dangerous because you have one policy for the whole of Europe. The, the great, I mean, Europe's strength is in its diversity of nations, actually, and that they're doing different things. It's much more, a Talib would call it resilient. You know, it's resilient. Um, but if you look at the European Union today. I mean, go, you know, there is almost no evidence to me that actually the EU has dealt with the same divides that I talk about in my book. I was criticised in 2018 when I wrote National Populism for mm. suggesting that those movements were going to become permanent players on the political system. Obvious. And as you can see in 2022, France, Sweden, Italy, Spain, mm. Portugal, record levels of support, Hungary as well, for national populists, there is no evidence in America that Republicans are abandoning the Trumpian model, even if they abandon Trump. And if you look across Western democracies, the new elite has, has still, I think, got a major challenge on its hands from groups of voters who, number one, are becoming more used to voting for alternatives and challenges because the tribal bonds that mm. used to hold the mm. main parties together mm. have broken down. Mm. Uh, number two, have become much more distrustful of the established new elite, people are not oh, even over they the last can, two years. They can see, oh, they can word. see yeah. the extent to which actually yeah. they do not share no. the cultural values of this ruling class, mm. and that includes, by the mm. way, mm. Um, minority ethnic voters, of course, from the working class, yes. who, as we can see yeah. in America, and also I would argue increasingly in Britain, especially British Indians, mm. are now beginning to understand that the people who claim to speak in their interest do not share the same cultural outlook as no, they do. That what all. they are signing up to is a brand of hyper-liberalism or radical progressivism, mm. which most Hispanic Latinos in America, Don't most African Americans, yeah. most British Muslims, yeah. Sikhs yeah. and Hindus are yeah. looking at and thinking, yeah. you know what, we actually, Lisa and Andy, I'm not really 
really down for my 13 year old legally changing their gender no. and the more that these cases become more, more prominent actually the old narrative that democracy is destiny long uh, held by progressives I think is really going to continue to come unstuck because mm. we have this ongoing and I call it a realignment because it is partly a a Western realignment of politics that I do think in one way or another is going to force its way through to the surface. It's not just about Brexit, it's not just about Jeremy Corbyn, it's about these deeper currents. The curious thing is that the Liberals never see, Liberals who cause these uh, these reactions, if you want to call them reactions, never see their role in causing it. So uh, I would say unless some of the things that caused these as you, national populism, whatever you want to call it, uh, are dealt with, it won't stop. It well, can't it, stop. It's and it all, simply yeah. won't. He said, "Won't." So it's all about inequality, right? It is. So, so if you're in the, if you're in the universities, um, if you deviate from the line that essentially it's all about economic inequality, or it's about people who are essentially racist and don't understand the benefits of migration, then you are. Well, these very, are, you're basically persona non grata but these because are, these, it's very difficult to present an alternative case, which I've consistently done because I think the evidence is pointing very clearly. Well, in that one, one of the reasons I admire your work is it is evidence based, it is based, and what, so a lot of the rather flaky ideas that some of these people have uh, just have a very very low correspondence with reality. Mm. I mean, it's a curious thing. I mean, we're diverting now, but in in in, in social science, social policy, humanities graduates leave university holding a whole series of ideas which have a totally disconnected, disconnected with quantitative uh, social science research, you know, on things like di on diversity and trust. You know, it's a completely against what they're saying. It doesn't seem to occur to, or the three years doesn't seem to have done them any good on the data. So I, I love you. But it's not only that. Once you have to understand that once you enter university as a full-time academic, mm. you are essentially occupying, inhabiting an environment that gives you a very warped view mm. of the rest of society. Yes, it does. And, and I totally I've agree. been in and out of universities for 20 plus years. I've lived this experience. Mm. And it gets worse the more elite the institution. I totally so, agree. I, you know, I, from, from Harvard and <clears throat> Oxford down, the, the world view that, that inhabits those corridors is, is less, less well connected to reality. Fundamentally yeah. at odds with reality. I, I totally uh, agree. But we can talk about that can we, at another time. Can, can we finish on, on uh, you, you, I mean, what you're saying is that the, the cultural environment we're in, the revolution, if you want to call it that, has created a, a situation where you, you ought to have, and I say ought for reason, you ought to have a political realignment. Uh, and what you, if I've understood it correctly, you say on the demand side for someone to express people's voices, traditionalist voices, demand side's fine. So in the UK, just think about the UK, who is going to supply it? We think we will, we're very small and growing, but who is going to supply the, the, the supply side to this? And I, uh, going through the runners, the big players, mm. I have no faith whatsoever in the Tory party doing this. Mm. I, I think I have characterised them as unpatriotic in their mm. attitudes to what, you know, mm. what is made and who owns stuff see the country as a shop, do nothing about housing, which is, a, which is the, the major issue for young people. Uh, Labour Party, as you say, has been taken over by uh, the elite Liberals entirely, completely. Uh, Lib Dems and Greens, probably even worse, actually. Um, so you need a political party to, 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 to be built to fill this gap. Uh, and I, I agree with you totally, it's a massive opportunity. But something, you do, just curiously, something you don't mention mm. so much in that section of the book is, is, the, is the hurdle of the voting system. Yeah. Do you agree? I mean, for the selection of candidates for the major parties and the system itself is a major block. So, so the barriers to entry for any challenger party, and I agree, by the way, we desperately need a political alternative mm. uh, to the big two, certainly. Um, but the barriers to entry are immense mm. and they've become higher since we've left the European Union mm. because we no longer have European Parliament elections under a system of PR. And, and also, I tend to think of this as being not just about politics, but also about the broader culture as mm. well. It's made more difficult by the fact that many of the institutions are disproportionately dominated by members of the new elite who mm. are very mm. hostile mm. to any alternative voice, uh, voices and vehicles mm. coming through. So Coverage. We've, we've, we've seen yeah. this in terms of how yeah. alternative vehicles are routinely stigmatized mm. as lying beyond the pale, mm. as being dangerous, extremist, and so mm. on and so forth. Mm. And this, as Michael Lind has 
written about in his book, The New Class War, this mm. is a, a device to basically mm. ensure that the new elite retain dominance over, but it doesn't, over just institutions. Just on, on Michael's point, it, it doesn't actually work always because it's, an, an in a way, it's Trump, wearing off. It's wearing off because yep. Trump sort of proves the point is actually he, he, the public have wised up to it. I think on a lot of these things, the public, it takes a wee bit of time for it to percolate, but they to get there. But I am, I am optimistic and, and, and less so about the electoral system, mm. but more so about the culture actually, because I mm. think for the first time in a long time, if you look at the media environment and the cultural environment, mm. we now have, gener we have a generation mm. of thinkers, of um, activists, of ideologues, of um, uh, you know, philosophers and others who are able to exist and build an ecosystem outside of the institutions. Yes. Now, whether yeah. that is YouTube, Substack, Twitter, whatever. Build their own things. For the first time in decade, well, first mm. time really in history, in recent history, we have um, a new independent creative class. And that mm. is a challenge to the dominance mm. of this new graduate elite, it is going to mean that the ecosystems are going to become mm. more diverse. Mm. It means that uh, funders and donors can can support and contribute to building that ecosystem. Mm. You see it in media mm. with um, you know the rise of GB News and Talk TV and mm. all of these other you know competitors and vehicles. Mm. Mm. And I think in politics, increasingly, mm. there will also there is this yearning, as we've seen over the last ten years. Mm this yearning for something different. It's no coincidence 60% of voters moved between parties over the last 10 years. Mm. That wouldn't have happened in the mm. 70s, the 80s. No, the it's 90s. much more up for grabs. It's fluid. Yeah. It's yeah. become much more fluid and combative. And so whoever connects with that, mm. and I think resource is an issue, mm. having money to do that, mm. I think mm. leadership is, mm. is critical. And mm. I think, to be frank, wedge issue politics is critical. Mm. Mm. Any challenger in Britain that has ever broken through has basically latched onto one or two wedge issues mm. and has turned everything against the main parties. You know, you think about the SDP, mm. you think about UKIP, Brexit party, you think mm. about the Greens to some extent. Mm. Um, and it is within our system, mm. the only meaningful, plausible way forward is mm. building that concentrated support mm. at constituency level. And that means having a message that really mm. connects with specific demographics. Mm. And that's mm. essentially, you know, obviously mm. what, what mm. UKIP and Brexit Party did by, by going mm. down the East Coast and mm. around the South East. Concentration. Yeah. It's concentration yeah. of support. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very, very difficult. The barriers to entry are very high. But as I say, when, when I look at the system as a whole, look at culture, politics, media, I, I am actually, for the first time in a long time, quietly optimistic I am. that the conversation is changing uh, and beginning to change yeah. in, in hopefully a constructive way. I'm very optimistic because I think the demand side is there. People are crying out for something different to represent. And I think personally, I think the wedge issue is who owns what and what is made. That's what that's the that's the key thing. Industry actually is the key thing. But listen, thanks very much. Uh, it was a wonderful speech. We've been for waiting a me. long time to interview. Yes, Actually, I've been waiting finally. to have a conversation for yeah. a long time as well. So uh, thank the, you book, for your time. the book is Values, Voice and Virtue by Matthew Goodwin. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. Cheers.